everybody. So welcome to this afternoon's cook along. My name is Claire and this is Alice. Hi. So the two of us will be showing you how to make some delicious Italian treats and we've been doing this all week but today is all about making homemade pasta. So it will be an opportunity to see everything from how to make it from scratch but also how to do it in lots of different ways as well. So whether you've got snug appliances or whether you haven't, um, it'll all be good. But it's because this week is all about Ferro Gusto, which is the Italian festival starting on the 15th of August, um, which over in Italy means that family and friends get together. They head out to the coast or to the countryside, enjoy good food, good drink all together. Uh, and I think it's an amazing celebration and something that uh, I definitely want to adopt over here. Um, but Claire, it, it dates back quite a long time, doesn't it? Yeah, it goes back to um, Emperor Augusto, who basically wanted to give um, a bit of a break to the farmland workers. And that's the origin of the festival. So as an Italian brand, we thought it only right that we should share our expertise in Italian cookery using these fabulous appliances. And some of you may have joined us yesterday. We looked at how to make perfect risotto yesterday. Today is all about pasta and tomorrow will be all about pizza. So today, feel free to sit back and watch and relax. If you're cooking along, then great. But this will be staying on YouTube after today so that you can go back and do the cook along at your own time. Yeah, as with all of the other cook alongs too. So if you are watching this at a later date, you can pause, you can press play whenever you're ready. So it's perfect for cooking along too. Brilliant. So pasta, what will today's cook along involve? So we are going to be showing you how to make the most beautiful and simple dough. I think many of us get a bit worried about making homemade mm -hmm. pasta, but actually it's really, really simple. And a lot of the foundations of Italian cookery are the fact that you can just grab simple store covered ingredients and turn it into something beautiful. So we'll be giving you our recipe for pasta. We're going to be showing you how to knead it, how to roll it, how to cut it. And then we're going to be making a very traditional sauce that you would find in the northern part of Italy, which is where Smeg's yeah, from. Yeah, absolutely. So Smeg is an Italian brand, which is why we're celebrating the Italian festival of Fede Gusto. Um, so I think we should get straight into it, Claire. I don't know about you, um, but let's start off with the key foundations to pasta, um, which, of course, is the flour. Um, so we're going to go with 100 grams of flour per person. So we're going to make um, 200 uh, grams worth of flour in here for two people. And the golden rule is 100 grams of flour to one egg. So if we go in with 200 grams of flour, we're of course adding two eggs. Now, this isn't any, uh, any old flour that I'm using here. Um, it's a very special type of flour. Claire, do you want to give us a bit of yeah, background about that Absolutely, you read my mind. I was going to tell everybody, but yes, exactly. This is, um, I guess it's a special type of flour, but it is essentially plain flour but it's milled very finely. So it's what we call a zero, zero flour. So um, you can actually get zero, zero flours in all sorts of different types of flours, but plain is obviously what we're looking for when it comes to making pasta. Now, you don't necessarily have to use the zero, zero flour if you don't have any in your cupboard. Like we say, it's all about store covered ingredients. Um, you just won't get such a silky smooth pasta that we're going to get because we've got this very smooth consistency that we're going for. So you weighed out your 200 grams, and as yep. we said, 100 grams, one egg, two eggs right in the center. And I'm actually gonna do the same here because we wanted to show you today in the cook along that you can have equipment to make life easier, but actually, if you wanna have a go and try it out by hand, you can as well. Definitely. So egg in the middle, <laughs> you've, gone there. You've, you've made your well, you're gonna whisk it in, aren't you? Yeah, so I've used my spoon to create a small well in the center to pop my eggs in. And traditionally, this would actually be done on the work surface, um, but a very uh, a lovely, messy and fun activity to do for sure. But to keep things clean, we're going to be doing it in a bowl today for the beginning. And then we'll also start kneading onto the work surface um, a little bit later. So we're giving you all the different ways of uh, making pasta at home, whether you have the equipment or not. Now, Alice, I'm going to add a little bit of salt into that well as well, just to give it the seasoning and flavour. Oh, yes, so please. Into yours. Thank you. With a good crack of salt. Thank you very much. That's a key part of it because uh, we will cover in a little bit about using um, salt when we're cooking the pasta because I know that's something that we uh, we often do. So I'm just going to incorporate this egg as much as I can with the fork initially. And then once it's all incorporated, I'm going to turn out on the work surface to knead 
And while I do this, Claire's just going to show you how to do it in the sand mixer. So you'll notice we're very tidy cooks, and that is important when you're making pasta because it can be incredibly messy. So many people will start what Alice is doing on the work surface, but this is a cheap rule. You do it in a bowl. Once it starts to come together, then roll it out to the work surface. So yes, I'm going to be using the Smeg Sand Mixer, which comes with three attachments, one of which is the dough hook, which I've got here. So this is brilliant because whilst Alice is working particularly hard, there's a theme, because yesterday you were hand grating and I was hand blitzing mm -hmm. onions. Today I'm literally going to put it on a nice low setting and let the mixer incorporate that egg and flour together to form my dough. Now, the first dark part is really just incorporating the flour into the egg. And whilst we say there's a ratio of flour and egg, Obviously, eggs come in different sizes and flowers come in different absorbency depending on the conditions that they've been stored. So what you might find that you need to do as you work your dough together is either add a little bit of olive oil or you can add a little bit of water, which looking at Alice, mm -hmm. you may choose to do that. So we go for water. I think so. Yes, please. But if you are perhaps making this uh, as a vegan alternative, maybe you don't want to use egg, um, you can actually replace the egg with olive oil and doing so gives you a really lovely rich colour too. Um, but you can absolutely just make it with plain water. Um, but the egg and oil does give a fantastic flavour to the dough. Now, some of you might also be thinking, well, what happens if I've got somebody who's gluten free mm. um, in the home? Because obviously we're using a glutinous flour. And it's actually simpler than most recipes to convert, isn't it, when you're going gluten free? And we've got a couple of ingredients underneath the counter just to show you really all that's different. So we've got some gluten-free flour here, um, which is a fantastic alternative because you can just use this in the exact same way that you would our normal flour. However, of course, we aren't needing this because there's no gluten to, uh, to activate. So to get that lovely stretch, we're going to add some xanthan gum as well. So as a general rule, for every 100 grams of gluten-free flour, add a teaspoon of xanthan gum. And that allows it to have that stretch that we're looking for and that elasticity that doing things like kneading provides us with. Brilliant. So yours is coming nicely together now. You've actually had to add a little bit of extra water and so you can use olive oil. Yep. Mine is starting to come together um, and we'll be starting that kneading process. Mm. So I'm now going to get my hands involved and just check the consistency of this. So I want to be able to ball it together, which I can do. So it can be quite deceiving when you're using, um, using it in the bowl because you'll see lots of little bits of flour flying around, but it's really important not to overwater it because that makes the rolling process really quite difficult. So I'm going to flour my work surface, first of all, to begin my kneading process. So whilst Claire can do everything all in the stand mixer, just easy. I'm going to so add a little easy. bit of water into my dough as well. We're using the same eggs in the same batch, so evidently the same consistency going on here. But you can see mine's all starting to come together as one piece. And very quickly, what Alice is going to show you is some hand kneading techniques. This is going to do it all for me. You need to do yours for about eight minutes, don't you? Okay. Whereas in here, we can just leave the machine to do its own thing, but literally just form it. So half the time. Easy peasy. Now, all flowers are different and have different absorbency levels. So you might find that even if you get the same brand, depending on how old it is, you might need more liquid in some, less in another. You might need to add more flour to compensate. It really just depends on the batch that you get. And that's all, all part of the fun, really. So uh, I think this is quite a nice consistency. It's got a little bit of grip. So there's a little bit of stickiness, which is exactly what you want when you're doing something like kneading, because you want some resistance when you're kneading on the work surface. Now, what we're aiming for is a lovely, smooth, silky and velvety dough. Um, so you can do this in several ways. You can push it, like I'm doing here, and fold it back over itself, like that. You can do one method, I think, where you can really get both hands involved and take your anger out, which I've got to say is a great one for children if they're trying to get involved in the kitchen. It's a lovely uh, summer holiday activity. But well, you've got a good technique to show, haven't you, Claire? I, I love this one because it's, I mean, okay, you get two hands messy, but you can literally just use the, the heel of both your hands and just push it away. You actually probably need um, less flour on the work surface than we've got here to get that resistance to get the work against the top. You just keep moving it like so with your hands and it just stretches that dough out. 
Now, again, you know, we talked about flowers as a zero zero flower. If you're wanting a slightly tougher dough that clings the sauce to it, you could even substitute half the flour with a bit of semolina flour as well. Definitely. And that really changes the consistency. So whilst we've got a velvety dough here, the semolina adds a little bit almost more grit to it. So you've got a thicker, more robust dough. So a bit more bite to it as well. Uh, and we will be covering off about al dente pasta later too. Indeed. Now, um, when I started with my dough, it looked like it was a little bit dry. And we do this on purpose to show you what you need to do to make the perfect dough. Cool. So I was concerned initially that my dough was too dry. I've added probably a little bit too much water. So this is the beauty. If it is a bit wet to start with, you can at least pour it back with a little bit of extra flour. And that will then come together to create that lovely smooth consistency. Yeah. Now you can't over knead dough, that's the beauty. Um, that's why we're sharing it and I'm already getting slightly out of breath. Um, but yeah, you can't overwork it. So just keep going You can take all your frustrations out. Totally. And with the mixer, some people say actually doing a dough in a mixer can be a bit too much hard work on the mixer, but we're very, very comfortable with this that this is gonna cope with that tough dough. Absolutely. I thought you were going to take over then. Keep going. <laughs> I can definitely do that, Claire, next. Uh, if you don't have a stand mixer, another alternative option is a food processor. You can pop your flour, your eggs, or whatever liquid you're using into the food processor with a blender blade and blitz gently to break it all up and combine together. Uh, it won't do the kneading for you, but it will do that initial combining stage that can be quite tricky. So uh, pop it in a food processor, give it a good blitz, and then knead as Claire is doing on the work surface here. So we've had a question come in, which is a very good question. I know we mentioned it, we perhaps glossed over it, but yes, we do use, when you're making gluten-free pasta, um, the additional ingredient of xanthan gum. So it begins with an X, it doesn't necessarily sound as it's spelt, um, but you just need to put a teaspoon in um, with your um, pasta dough and your mix with your eggs and that will give you that little bit of an extra elasticity that you don't tend to get with a gluten-free flour, okay? Right, now while Claire's doing that, I'm going to pop on the oven for something that we're going to be doing in a little bit. So this is going to be for our sauce because we've got a beautiful sauce coming up. So if you are cooking along, um, we're going to go for... Um, 200 degrees on a fan oven, or alternatively, if you don't have a fan oven, just go for 220. Um, and I'm gonna go with our classic fan function here called circular, 200 degrees, and that's going to preheat. It'll give me a little beep when we're ready to go. So that is going to be for our delicious and traditional Italian sauce that we're making, which is a beautiful butternut squash, brown butter and sage. The roasting butternut squash. So how's it looking, Claire? So my dough's come together quite nice. It's a little bit stickier than yours, um, but it's still good. And you know that technique I mentioned about before? This is exactly in that state where we can just roll it forward and backwards to make that nice smooth dough. Now we've been stretching the gluten in the dough at this point, and it's a bit like us when we go to the gym and you need to have a rest after a workout so that the um, gluten fibres just relax a little bit. So that's the next stage of the pasta making, and that is to let it rest. Absolutely. So what you do for this step is quite simply wrap it in cling film, nice and tight, and then you just leave it on the work surface for about 20 minutes to have a bit of a breather. And the reason we do that is we don't want it kind of stretching back. So when you're trying to roll it out, it tends to shrink if you don't give it that resting time. So definitely worth putting in that extra bit of time and allowing your dough to do what it needs to do. So I'm just going to get these ready and then we can leave them on the side uh, to have a bit of a breather. And we do have some tips later coming as well for storing the dough and, uh, and doing things like freezing it too. Okay, now we need to rest that dough for about 20 minutes at room temperature. Um, if you're not doing it you know, immediately for preparing, then why not just um, let it rest in the fridge so you can use those options. But to be honest, this dough will last for at least 24 hours actually just resting on the side. Yep, lovely. So I'll pop that down here, ready for later. And we're going to move on to now preparing that sauce that you've just popped the oven on. Lovely. So it's actually a butternut squash um, sauce or pumpkin really, pumpkin and sage mm. and brown butter pasta. 
And there's a, a couple of different variations of this, isn't there, Alice, that they have in Italy? And we've kind of done our own twist on it. Yeah, there are quite a few. Now, a lot of the traditional recipes also call for pumpkin. Um, and you'll probably see lots of lots of different recipes like that uh, flying around on, uh, on new sites, especially during the autumn time, because we tend to get lots of pumpkins around that point. Now, there are some useful tips that we have when doing something with pumpkins, because the ones we get at the supermarket to carve, they're not really suitable. The Halloween for... pumpkins are definitely not good for eating, are they? Halloween pumpkins, absolutely not. You want the lovely, sweet, little pumpkins um, that are perfect for this kind of recipe. So they have a real kind of, um, I would say, familiarity with the butternut squash. They're, they're very similar in terms of flavour and also how they behave in the oven and the way we cook with them. So it's a really, really nice thing to try if you've ever, um, maybe you're wanting to carve a little pumpkin. You could use the insides for that too. So definitely go for a small, sweet eating pumpkin or cooking pumpkin rather than the large carving pumpkins that you get in the supermarket. Now, uh, oh, I've just seen a question pop up. Uh, what temperature is the oven preheated to? And it's 200 degrees on fan function or 220 degrees. And we're going to then roast this lovely butternut squash uh, in that shortly. Now, a great tip that I have for cutting butternut squash, not that you're not doing a great job here, Claire, um, but for peeling and cutting, if you spike your butternut squash with a fork and then microwave it for a couple of minutes. Don't forget to pierce it with a fork. Definitely <laughs> pierce it. We don't want any exploding butternut squashes, um, but it can help to loosen that skin and also the flesh inside as well, because these are firm to cut. Uh, so if you are doing it maybe with some uh, some little helpers, if you've got children around, um, adult supervision definitely, because these are uh, yeah, a, bit of a bit of a challenge sometimes. Okay, so um, I have peeled it, and another good point as well is that these peelings, we don't like food waste at Sleg, but there's no reason why you can put these on a baking tray with some olive oil and some salt and turn them into some crisp. So don't waste it. Um, and actually, I've only used the top part of the butternut squash, mm. which to be honest is the easy bit, because of course down the bottom there's that hollow section with the seeds. Yeah, so the seeds inside, as with pumpkins as well, can be washed. And then we like to coat them with a little bit of olive oil, some salt, some pepper, and you can roast those for a really tasty snack. So we're all about minimising food wastage. Now, Claire has been beautifully chopping these up into about one centimetre cubes, if you can see there. Um, so ideally, if you go as even as possible to make sure they all cook nice and evenly and get a lovely golden brown on all of them. So we just put them onto the pan. If you wouldn't mind, Alice, just drizzling them with some olive oil, some salt and pepper, just to give them some nice flavour. Absolutely. So I'm going over the top with some olive oil here, and I will actually get my hands involved in the packing to uh, really coat them. A nice helping of salt and a bit of pepper too. And then it's as simple as that, really. They just go in the oven, and because they, uh, they're they quite nice and small, they do cook reasonably quickly. So give these a good toss around. Make sure they're all nice and coated. And you might find that they do need a bit of a shuffle mid-bake as well, just to get all of the sides nice and golden. Um, but that's our butternut squash ready to go. So hopefully you're up to the same point as us if you are cooking along. Um, so I'm going to pop these in the oven. And they're probably going to go in there for about 20 minutes. But our advice is absolutely check them just a few bit, well, a few moments in between. So probably every 10 minutes, give them a little stir with a, a fish um, slice just to make sure they're browning on the outside. But we're looking like um, a nice caramelised outer and starting to get a little bit soft and sweet. Now to finish off this sauce, we are going to obviously have our roasted butternut squash but we're going to be later on making this brown butter and sage sauce. So I've got two ingredients here, which is all that's going to comprise that sauce. And here is the sage, beautifully picked from one of our team's gardens this morning. And um, we're going to take just the leaves of the sage off the plant. Um, there's lots of different herbs out there. Some of them have softer stems. This is one of those ones with really woody stems. So you just want the leaves. And I'll tell you what, if there was scratch and sniff on YouTube Live, Amazing. it smells absolutely beautiful. And again, the velvety touch of the um, sage leaves is something else as well. Now, we need to finely chop these, but actually there's a very simple way to do it. So you can just literally pile 
the sage leaves up we do so like that so literally put them one on top of the other that's our oven ready and up to temperature so that was quick and what we do once we've got that stack of leaves is we're going to in fact if i move it over here you can see it on this camera i'm just going to roll it up and i'll chop just here as well so you can see but basically now it's in a roll all we can do is just run the knife along it and we get some really beautiful fine strips that will form part of the sauce. So we've got just, a, I'd say probably about 10 to 12 leaves of sage there. And these ones are a little bit smaller, so they don't need rolling, but we'll just run along to get those strips. And then it's just 75 grams of butter, yep. which we are just going to cube so that when it goes into the sauce, it will be very quick and easy to melt. But later on, you'll see how it's just that cooking off process and taking that butter just to the point of almost burning, which is where that brownie yeah. and nutty flavour comes from. You really have from. to watch that pan. And uh, I think it's a lovely process to be able to watch. And you also find that sage very light on that too, because you get a beautiful nutty fragrance. Um, but as Claire said, you are taking it just before the point of burning, so the milk solids start to caramelise. So you've definitely got to keep an eye out. Right, so I'm going to put that away for later. Brilliant. I'm going to move on to the next step of the dish. Okay, so um, we know that you perhaps don't want to necessarily watch us wait 20 minutes to uh, to bring out our pasta. Um, so we are, have actually made a bit of pasta ahead of time. So we've got some pre-rested and ready to roll. And of course, we are going to show you different ways of rolling this pasta if you don't necessarily have a stand mixer like us. Okay, so... To start off with though, um, we will use the stand mixer and as I say, show you the other techniques. Now with all of the smoke mixers at the very nose of the machine, you've got what looks like just a normal part of the design, but actually this just unscrews to allow you to put additional attachments in. So yes, we're going to be using pasta rollers and cutters today, but there's no reason why you couldn't put a slice and a grater in there, you can put a sausage maker in there. There are so many that you can choose from. So what we want to do is line up the pasta device, okay? So he's in the end there. And what happens is as I turn this dial up, it's going to rotate the rollers that are inside this pasta rolling piece of equipment. Now at the tip of the machine here, or the roller, I've got different numbers that I can select. And when I'm looking closely, I can see that when I've got it on number zero, it's quite wide. And then as we work our way through the numbers, it starts to narrow. So that's exactly how we're going to start. We're going to start by almost kneading it a little bit yep. and then start to work it way nice and slowly. Now, we are going to need plenty of flour during this process. Absolutely. That is key. <laughs> that is the secret. So it does get a little bit messy at this stage, but that's OK. That's all good. We want, we want a bit messy with flour. So I'm going to pop some on the work surface. The idea is that you have it to hand. So if you feel like your dough is starting to get a touch sticky, you can just add as you go along. You'll know if it's too sticky as it pulls through the machine because it will actually start to almost wrinkle itself. And that's definitely not what we want. No. So what I've done is I've made my pasta into a small oval and I'm just going to let the natural um, mechanism of the machine just pull through the pasta. And I'm doing this nice and slowly. And that's the beauty of this machine. You can control the speed as you become mm -hmm. more and more confident in rolling the pasta. Um, and once it's through, the first couple of times, you want to almost do like an envelope fold. So I'm going to coat a little bit of extra flour, but then fold it in on itself, in on itself again, and then put it through the machine. Now I'm going to get a bit braver, and we'll just feed it through at a faster rate. And this is all part of that kneading process. And you can see it's already starting to form, and it's becoming, again, much, much smoother than what we've seen before. Now, Alice, if someone hasn't got one of these machines, mm. there's lots of different alternatives out there in how you can achieve this rolling process. But essentially, before you tell everyone, so I can crack on, basically, um, I'm going to do that fold one more time. And I'm gradually going to feed my piece of dough through this machine yep. until about setting five or six. But we are looking for something that's almost see-through through the back of your hand, very silky smooth and cloth-like. Yeah, so Claire's machine is going to get thinner and thinner as she moves up the uh, the number settings. So her little gap's gonna get smaller so it gets a lovely thin dough. But as Claire said, if you don't have one of these, um, there are several alternatives. So for example here, 
This is a manual plaster roller, and this attaches to the work surface with a clamp, and it behaves in very much the same way as the automatic stand mix that we've got there. So you feed it through, and you actually manually use this device here to spin it. So you're going to do that bit. And I'm going to catch that. But that's the thing is you've got to be a bit ambidextrous, haven't you? Precisely. Yeah, you, you do have to have a little bit of uh, bit of coordination to get going with this one. But it's a fantastic idea to use if you've got one. Um, and our top tip would be have a damp cloth that you can pop underneath the machine. And that means it will stay in place. It'll be really nice and secure, won't wobble around and you protect your work surface as well. Now, a bit of advice, um, the snake machine here is working from zero, which is the widest setting, and it's going to go um, higher in numbers, but it gets thinner in thickness. Now, that machine, I know for a fact, is the opposite. So its highest number is its widest setting. Yeah. So do just check by looking visually at the width of the rollers to um, determine. Now, if you haven't even got one of those, you're going to go right back to basics, can't you? Absolutely. So we go back to the classic rolling pin. And in Italy, this is exactly how they would roll out their pasta dough. So my advice would be to get a small piece initially, start rolling, and you have to use a bit of elbow grease to get down to that perfect thinness that you're hoping for. But again, if we can mirror what we're getting here, nice and thin, probably about a millimetre or two in thickness, that's exactly what we're hoping for. So that'll make it really nice and easy to dry, to cut, um, and hopefully it won't be too difficult to roll as well. So if in doubt, you can always go for a classic rolling pin. Brilliant. So lots of different options there. Now you can see my dough is coming along quite nicely. And this is the point at which you may decide if it gets a bit too hard to handle, even with the machine doing most of the work, you may choose to cut the pasta into shorter lengths, which makes it a little bit more manageable. But I think we're doing all right. I think I'm coping. This is um, looking good. Yeah. And I've only got one more notch to go. And that is up to setting six. And it is almost, you can definitely see, I don't know if you can see it on here, but you can just about see my hand through the pasta. Oh, yeah. So beautifully silky and thin. I think when we come to cut it, Alice, um, I think we will carve it. Definitely. It's looking long now. It's amazing and how far it goes. And it is up to personal preference as well, how thin you want to go. So, for example, if you're making lasagna sheets, which these could absolutely be, easy peasy, I tend to like mine a little bit thicker. So you could go for a a lower setting if you wanted to or perhaps you like fettuccine a little bit chunkier if you are cooking with semolina and you've got semolina in the dough you can actually go even thinner because it's more robust you're not going to see uh, the splitting that you would if we went up to a, a high number with this uh, dough here with just the plain flour so Claire split these in half to make it nice and easy to manage um, and what are we going to go for here, Claire? So because it's going to be a tagliatelle, now this dish that we are making, we've put our own twist on it because, yes, pasta making is simple and hopefully we've shown you that. But actually, it does take a little bit of time and practice to know how to handle it correctly. Mm -hmm. So we kept it simple today. And this is going to be a tagliatelle with, you know, good chunks of the butternut squash and that brown and, and sage sauce. But um, this dish has kind of started, well, it did start in Italy, as tortellini, where you'd roast off the butternut squash, mash it, and turn it into those lovely formed parcels. But maybe that's a, a live for later on. So um, I'm going to remove this attachment, and we're going to replace it with one of two, actually, additional ones that you get. So this one is the fettuccine, which is our tagliatelle. And then we've got the other one behind us, which is the spaghetti attachment. Yes, it's really, really thin. It's almost, uh, I think that one's tagalini, so it's incredibly thin. I think it's also known as um, angel hair pasta. So it's so beautifully thin, very, very delicate. Or even like our spaghetti, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Alice, I think because we were going to get in close to um, cooking this pasta, let's pop our pot onto a nice high boil. And that's going to get yeah. it ready um, for us to cook. And that's going to allow me, first of all, to cut, but also for you to show the guys how, again, if you haven't got one of these cutters, which gives us this nice, consistent finish, yeah. um, how you would do it by hand. Now, to be honest, guys, what you wouldn't do is normally cut it so instantly after rolling it. You normally let it dry a little bit before cutting it. Um, it will make it just easier. But again, we don't necessarily want you to have to watch and wait for that to happen. So we are literally just going for broke and going straight in now. We are indeed. 
So what I'm doing here is just folding the sheets over quite loosely and make sure you've got a good bit of flour in between so they don't stick together. That is key when we're doing the rolling. So making sure again, we've got a nice bit of flour in between, keep it really loose. And then all I'm going to do is using this knife here, cut to the thickness that I'm hoping for for each strand. So I'm mimicking what Claire is doing with hers. So chunkier than spaghetti. And you can also use a pizza cutter, can't you? You can, if helps. definitely. Or if you're into your, your cake decorating, that's another really good one because the cake decorating, you get some of those really consistent cutters that go straight away across. And so now, as you can see, I'm just unwinding these lovely little parcels here and it gives me some beautiful strands of fresh pasta. I think this is so fun to do and you get kind of instant gratification for cutting these up here. So I'm just going to unwind these. And what we recommend doing after you've cut them is to create little nests of pasta. So add a little bit of flour if they are feeling a bit sticky and it will stop them from all sticking together. Move them about a little bit, and there you have some lovely handmade fresh pasta cut by hand too. Brilliant. So whilst you were doing that, Alice, I have just gone and given the butternut squash a stir. It's already starting to brown on the side, so it's got that lovely caramelised mm. flavour flavor that's coming through. So um, we've got our pasta here, um, and you can see why perhaps the cutter, this is no reflection on artist's cutting skills, um, but the consistency that you get in terms of sizes when you go through, and that's all going to, a bit like with the risotto we did yesterday, yeah. it's going to all help with cooking it through nice and easily. Now, we've shown you so far how to make the pasta and then how to cut it, but actually of an evening, this can be quite intense, can't it? And you may choose not to spend your evenings making pasta from scratch. So what you can do is you can keep the pasta in the fridge for a quite considerable amount of time, but also you can freeze it too, can't you? You can, yeah. So you can keep your pasta dough in the fridge for up to about two days, but do keep in mind that as your flour sits in the fridge, it does tend to change colour a little bit. So the best time to use it is as soon as you make it, but you can absolutely freeze the dough before you cut it or after you've cut it as well. So if you freeze it before you've cut it, pop it in in the cling film, make sure you label it so you know exactly what's going on, and then you can take it out, defrost, and it's resting at the same time. If you choose to uh, cut your pasta first, I'd recommend cutting, leaving to dry a little bit, and then freezing in the nests like we've got here. So you can just pop them into your water to cook. Now, if you are drying, you can leave it on the side, but there's another way that some people dry. You can get these um, mm. trees, they're pasta trees, I think, aren't they? That allow you to hang your pasta to properly dry. But just by simply putting a wooden spoon or perhaps even putting a rolling pin across that will allow you to let it dry totally um, before you come to use it. And then, of course, it will last that little bit longer. So hopefully you can see that there. And this will just mean that you get kind of full aeration of your lovely ooh, lovely little pieces of pasta there and you can also do this across a baking tray if your pasta is long enough to achieve as well brilliant okay so we'll leave that one to dry for later on let's so in, in between time whilst our pasta is getting ready to go so just drying a little bit before going into the water and while our water comes up to a boil we might as well get going with the sage and brown butter sauce. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to start by heating up this pan here. So I'm going to put this on a medium to high temperature setting. I'm going to about seven and this goes up to a nine plus a power boost function. So that is around the, uh, the middle mark there. And Claire's popping in this butter for me. It is salted butter. And you get so much lovely flavour out of salted butter. Of course, you can use unsalted as well. I've got to say, the difference is, is quite dramatic. Uh, so feel free to add a touch of salt if you are using unsalted butter. Now, the way this is going to work is, oh, thank you, the butter's going to melt as you would normally expect. And then we're going to see it start to foam. So we are going to carry on cooking through this entire foaming process. You'll see the milk solids start to pull away um, from the liquid and then they will start to cook down. So we're going to get this nice and hot in here. So Alice, what temperature or what setting have you got the hog on? So this is an induction hog, guys. If you've not seen one before, 
there's lots of heat sources now available for you to choose from. There's the standard electric, which are those ones that glow red. Um, you've got the induction, which actually has no heating under the glass. It uses magnets, which this is. And then you've got your pan um, acting as that conductor of heat, which makes it very, very quick and it efficient. Does. And then you've got your gas. So with our electric induction hob that we've got here, Alice has just brought it up to a temperature of nine or setting nine, which is the highest setting at this um, well, for this particular model. It is, and that's really just to just to get this going nice and quickly. You can see it's bubbling away here. Now, just keep in mind, if you do go for a high setting, you need to be quite on it because <laughs> it turns very quickly. So whilst it's foaming, as it is here, you'll see the solids start to break away. Here's the foam. And in that foam, there are the solids. So at the moment, we are, we're still in the foaming stage. But if you run your spoon continuously through it, you'll eventually start to notice it going a bit golden. So I'm going to turn this down just so I don't miss it. So I've gone down to seven and I can see already underneath there, I'm getting streaks of gold. Yeah. So I'm carrying on cooking that down for a touch longer, but this is where you need to pay full attention here. Keep stirring that foam, keep making sure you're checking underneath because you don't want it to go over the, uh, the brown butter into burnt butter. Yeah. And it's the brown butter that's gonna create that beautiful nutty flavor that we know and love that you know is a fine line um, but actually, you know, as long as you keep an eye on it, Alex, you can't really go wrong with it. Can you, you can't. So I would say we are pretty much there. So underneath, if you can see that on camera, that's nice and golden under there. So I'm going to turn that off. And whilst I do that, Claire's going to add in the lovely chopped sage. And it's going to become really nice and fragrant. It's going to sizzle and it's going to actually start frying this sage a little bit here too. So it brings out all wow. of those gorgeous natural flavors. So we've got the nuttiness of the butter. It's sweet, it's caramelized, and you can see it foaming up, frying that beautiful sage there. It's my favorite part. So I am taking that completely off the heat now, just allowing that to mingle with the sage. And we can set that aside because that is pretty much our sauce done. We are going to add, of course, the pasta to it, which contains a little bit of pasta water when we take it out later, um, but a beautifully simple sauce just awaiting the squash from the fridge and from the garden. Very, very easy. Right, now I can see there's a fair amount of steam coming out of that pasta pot, which is one of our it's bigger ready. pots that we've got, but holds a good old volume of water and therefore a large volume of pasta that's cooking. Now, a secret to cooking pasta is in fact making sure that you have to roll and boil. If you don't have the rolling boil, what will happen is when this pasta goes into the water, it will clump together. So my mum used to have this theory where you always used to put oil in the water. Sorry, but it's not the case. You need to make, well, maybe it is, it's different traditions, isn't it? Don't want to offend anyone, but just have a nice rolling boil so when it falls into there, the agitation of the water is going to stop it. That's it, it's all about the agitation, so continuous movement. So Claire's gonna pop that in, and as she does, it's going to drop the temperature down. So I'm actually just going to flip the uh, where the pan is positioned to make sure that we can see it over here. So I'll pop that onto this one. You should be able to get a good view. And I'm gonna put this up to a high temperature to make sure now that pasta has gone in and brought down the temperature, we're bringing it straight back up again because this is a really quick process that we've got going on here. It's going to be just a matter of one to two minutes. And you might have noticed that we haven't salted the water, which might sound a little controversial. If we're doing something like dried pasta, it's recommended that we salt the pasta water. What, what's the uh, what's the expression that we use? So we would say it should taste like the sea. Yeah. Um, but I think you know it's it's not worth it, is it? Really? Maybe with dried pasta, yes. Dried pasta absolutely it absorbs that lovely it's flavor for such a long time, isn't it? Yeah. But with uh, with fresh pasta, where we're cooking it for one to two minutes. Um, it really doesn't affect the uh, the flavour of the pasta. It has no chance, does it? Now, Alice mentioned one to two minutes to cook, but you might see from here that it's actually all floated to the top. And that's a really good sign that the pasta mm -hmm. is good to go. So really, really quick. Now, you'll notice there is not a colander in sight at this stage. 
um, because what we don't want to do is drain this pasta into a colander and all that flour that was coating the pasta ends up in the bottom of our, our pan. It's not what we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to use either tongs or a pasta fork to literally just take it across. I'm going to let you do it, Alice, because you're a bit closer. <laughs> and whilst you're doing that, I'm going to go and get the, um, the butternut squash Ooh, out of the oven. So what's going to happen here is that lovely water will mingle with this butter to help create our beautiful sauce. And hopefully you can see on camera that gorgeous colour. It should be nutty, it should be rich, really, really fragrant. And of course, mingling again with that sage. And Claire's got our butternut squash out of the oven now. And depending on the size that you cut your butternut squash will of course depend on your cook time. Um, a nice one to do also is mashing the butternut squash as well, if you wanted it more of a uh, more of a pureed sauce. But it's so lovely and traditional to have these gorgeous chunks of butternut squash running throughout. Little bites of sweetness, yeah. isn't it? So I'm going to muddle this around, combine it, and hopefully you can see this gorgeous sauce here. What a dish. So easy to do. So few ingredients as well. You know, you don't need lots of lots of really expensive different ingredients. Chances are you probably have most of these at home already. You might have sage growing in the garden, um, but the butternut squash, really nice and seasonal that we're coming up to. So a perfect dish for autumn. Um, dare I say it at this point in August, but we've got our beautiful pasta here, fresh butternut squash and sage. I'm going to turn off our water from the hob. And then I'm going to place it up. I'm thoroughly looking forward to this. Now, um, we've salted the pasta. There is all of that flavour and sweetness coming from the butternut squash. So I think the only correct and right way to finish off this dish is to have a good shave of parmesan. Now, if you know Smeg really well, we aren't just an appliance brand, but we actually make food products as well. We truly are foodie. And um, we own our own farm where we make parmesan cheese, we make wine, we make chutneys, balsamic vinegars. And um, it allows us then, of course, to incorporate that into some of our lovely dishes. So if you want to buy some of this stuff, um, it's actually available in our London store. Um, but it comes in three different varieties. You've got a um, 12 month, a 36 month and oh, I missed out the 24. <laughs> but really, it's the um, 12 month that you would use in cooking. Oh, this smells absolutely incredible. So Claire's shaving this on with a vegetable peeler. I don't know if you noticed. Our favourite technique to get the absolute most out of the block of Parmesan cheese. And you get some beautiful, lovely crunches of salt rich Parmesan as well. And um, I don't know about you, Claire, but I'm absolutely desperate to try this. Yeah, we should definitely try it. Now, this is just one of many pasta recipes that we have on our website. And I know that it's appeared in the chat for you to follow to make it a different um, time. You'll also notice that back earlier in the year, we did a live with Theo Randall, who is a, an infamous um, English chef with an Italian soul. And he shared our, um, his asparagus carbonara. So um, check out that live video as well if you want a twist and also Theo's twist on his pasta recipe, which is a little bit different to ours because it incorporates that semolina flour. It does, yes. Yeah, so it's a really interesting one to watch, actually. Um, so please do check out the rest of our videos if you'd like to have some uh, some cookery demonstrations mm -hmm. or cookery classes anytime that you'd like. So thoughts? We need to talk now. Mm. That means none of us can talk right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Amazing. So really, really tasty, isn't it? And so simple. Wow. Well, and I think would really impress if you were to give this a go. Um, so this, guys, as you know, or may not know, um, this is one of many lives that we're doing this week, all in aid of Ferragusto, which is the Italian festival or the, the bank holiday that's celebrated mm -hmm. right here, right now in the middle of August. And we thought we would share our Italian recipes with you. So there is already a risotto live for you to view, but tomorrow we will also be doing pizza. Now, you'll have seen today that we were talking about cooking along if you want to cook along, book via our Eventbrite page, just search Smeg UK. Um, and if you do that, um, you can then get the list of ingredients you need to cook along. Or if you just want to turn up and watch, and of course, watch back, play, pause, and recreate the recipe in your own time, then of course, feel free to do so. So this week is all about Ferragusto. Watch out for some sessions in September as well. One is all about making fabulous gnocchi. Mm -hmm. 
And if you are looking at kitting out your kitchen, especially in time for Christmas, join us, or perhaps you want to learn how to make the perfect Christmas dinner, join us also in September, where we will be doing an experienced SMEG demonstration. Now, just finally, it's gone into the chat. Um, if you've enjoyed this afternoon, let us know. We've just put a link for you to click on. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon, whether that's live or whether that is on our playback on the YouTube channel. But we hope you've enjoyed. Um, and we certainly are. So have a great lunch or dinner or whatever, whatever time you're making this. I think it's a perfect recipe. To be honest, at any time of day. Okay, so we're going to enjoy Bye Cheers. Bye. Ciao.